Hello everyone, this is Carrie from Your Level Best and today I'm going to demonstrate a healthy special occasion meal. This meal is actually for my husband's and mine wedding anniversary. And one of the things that we found, uh, especially since we're frugal and we're also trying to stay healthy, is that going out to eat is not necessarily a good option. Not to say that restaurants are bad. The problem is with a couple of things. First, you have to get dressed up and go out somewhere. And there are a lot of days where I don't feel like doing that. Not that it isn't a lot of fun sometimes, but most of the time I don't feel like doing that. I would rather relax at home. The other thing, it's expensive. Um, if you want to get a high quality meal somewhere, we're not talking about going to your typical chain restaurant that, you know, you can get some cheap food and it's, it's pretty good, but nothing to write home about. If you want to get a good high quality dinner, don't be surprised if you're spending 50 or $60 a person, uh, especially on some of the stuff I'm going to make today it actually would cost you quite a bit at a restaurant. And then finally, you really don't know what the chef is putting in the meal. Chefs know how to make a meal taste good. And that means adding a lot of fat, carbohydrates, as well as salt. So they're adding a lot of different things that make it taste good, but not necessarily make it healthy. So what I'm gonna to do today is demonstrate what I'm making for our anniversary dinner. And I like to do things at home. I've actually made our anniversary dinner for us every single year since the first year, because I like to celebrate our anniversary with something special. I like to make a dinner and a dessert, make them healthy so that we don't feel guilty about splurging. And I know that um, some folks are like, well, you know, what you might cook today looks a little small. Yes, the serving sizes are gonna be a little smaller than you think, but I wanna keep our splurges to times when we don't have a lot of choice but to eat something that's a little bit unhealthy. So things like when I have to go to a conference for work, that during those, I don't have a lot of choice on what I get to eat. So what I'm gonna do today, it's a two-parter. It's, it's the main course and dessert. So first I'm gonna start with a dessert. Um, this is a very simple dessert. It's very healthy. The servings are only 87 calories and they're very healthy. So let me go over the ingredients that I'm going to put in my blender here. So of course I have my blender and I also have some almond milk, some maple syrup, some cocoa powder, some vanilla extract, and I also have an avocado. Um, when you look at the close-up, I am missing the almond milk, but you do need a little bit of almond milk for this. So what I'm gonna do right now is, I'm just gonna put everything in the blender. How easy is that? This makes four servings, so I'm gonna have a couple left over. So let me take the top off here, and if you've never done an avocado before, you've never cut up an avocado, it's actually pretty simple. So you just need to take a sharp knife like this and go all the way around the avocado. Now make sure your avocado is fairly soft. If your avocado is, um, if your avocado feels a little bit hard, you may want to use one that's a little bit more ripe for this. One that's, that's not very ripe, it isn't going to work for you. So you'll notice I have this pit. So I'm going to take the knife here and I'm going to remove the pit. So there's the pit, and I'm going to throw this away. I had to get a little bit of that, that gunk off my hands here. And because we're putting this in a blender, we don't really need to do anything else but scoop out the flesh. So I'm just going to scoop out the flesh of both halves into my blender. And here's the second. And avocados are so easy to work with. I love working with these. They are creamy, they're wonderful, and they go in a lot of things, including desserts. So, now I'm going to also add my cocoa powder, my almond milk, my maple syrup, 
And then my vanilla extract. I'm gonna go ahead and put the top on. And I'm going to puree this. This will take about a minute to puree, but it should come out very thick and creamy. I'll show you what it looks like when it's done. So you can see this is a thick consistency. This is more pudding-like. So you can see that it's very thick, very creamy, and definitely like a dessert. And welcome back. So you got to see what it looked like from the inside of the blender and I have it all dished out for our dinner. Kind of made some um, servings that are a little small for my taste, but that's okay. I do experiment a lot with different recipes and I think if somebody's looking for a big pudding dessert, this probably wouldn't be it. And it's also not as sugary because it's only using the maple syrup for the sweetener. So you can add a little bit of artificial sweetener or you can add a little bit of sugar if you want that hint of sweetness. But I think we're gonna look forward to this particular dessert after dinner. So on to the next part of the recipe, which will be, actually the next part of the dinner I should say, um, will be the steak. So I am making some steak and some vegetables for our main course. So I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. Hello everyone. And now we're going to work on the main course for this dish. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my pan. I have, it looks like a nonstick skillet and it is, but this particular nonstick skillet actually works really well for searing meat too. So I don't have to smoke up the house with a, um, with, with a stainless steel or a cast iron because right now we don't have the greatest of ventilation. So it, when I use my stainless steel and my cast iron pans and I'm searing something, uh, it, the smoke gets everywhere. So this is a way that I can still sear and not make a mess in the house. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on. And you wanna keep in mind that you wanna, you wanna get this pan really hot. You don't want to place your meat into a pan and you don't hear anything because then it's not gonna sear the meat. Um, and searing the meat's important. A lot of people think searing the meat has everything to do with sealing in the juices of the meat, which it most certainly doesn't. Um, what ends up happening is when you put meat into a pan, the um, proteins relax a little bit and the juices actually come out when it relaxes. And how do you keep it juicy if, well, when I start cooking it, all the juices are gonna come out anyway? Actually, the best way to distribute meat juices back into your meat is actually to rest. And you'll notice a lot of recipes tell you to rest your meat at the end. So we are gonna do that with this particular pan. And it looks like we've got a little wisps of smoke, but that's okay. Um, we're not smoking up the house or anything like that. Um, it probably has a little bit of oil on the bottom of the pan, which happens all the time. Um, so I'm gonna go over the ingredients that I'm using for the main dish. Now, I also have a side dish in front of me. This is, um, this is actually some squash. I'm doing some summer squash because it's low calorie. It tastes great. I'm gonna steam it in the microwave. Um, I also have my four ounce pieces of beef tenderloin. And beef tenderloin is great and I wish I could eat it more often because it's a lean piece of meat and it's also lower in calories. It's actually closer to chicken, but because it's so expensive, I only eat it on special occasions and I actually made a couple of steaks from a larger beef tenderloin that I used over the holidays. And the best way I found to buy pork, ten or pork tenderloin, excuse me, beef tenderloin, is to actually buy the entire tenderloin and I actually get mine from the um, restaurant supply store where they'll, where they'll sell me a whole uh, beef tenderloin for a lot less. So I actually buy them that way and I cut my steaks or I use a roast, things like that. So I have two four ounce steaks and it may not sound like a lot, um, but really your portion of meat should be the size of a deck of cards. So it's not as much as you think. And you wanna make sure that you're not overloading your calorie count because if you're eating that big piece of steak, a lot of times those big thick porterhouses or strip steaks or you know, you get one that'll fit on the size of a plate, you're talking like 7,800 calories and you don't even realize it. 
So yes, I'm going with something very lean and something high quality and very tasty. Um, I also have a couple other things here. I have some nonstick spray, of course, to um, help brown the meat. I also have some chicken stock, some pomegranate juice, which is going into the pan sauce. I have some red wine, and I have some chopped shallot and a little bit of thyme for the sauce. And I also have some salt and pepper, which I'm going to season the beef with, um, and also season the salt or season the sauce, excuse me, and also season the um, squash. And I also have some butter. We do use butter in this to finish the sauce to give it a little bit of silkiness. So, looks like my pan is ripping hot like it's supposed to be. So I'm actually going to take some of my salt and pepper and hit the first side of the steaks here. So we have some seasoning on the side that we're going to put into the pan. I'm going to spray it with a little bit of nonstick spray. You don't need a lot. And now I'm going to lay these in and you should hear a sizzle, which should sound absolutely amazing. And really, you should only leave these in for a minute or two per side because if you leave them in too long, especially if you like your meat on your rear side, you want to make sure that you know you don't leave it in too long. And the other way I'm actually going to make sure that the steaks don't get overcooked is with a thermometer. A lot of people ignore the use of a thermometer. They use, you know, they use their fingers, they use some other things, but really I want to make sure that my steaks are actually done to the way that I like them. And we like them about medium rare. I like rare steaks, but I have to have a very, very high quality steak to be really, really rare. So even though these are good steaks, probably not what I would go rare with. I do actually eat um, uncooked steak. I've had steak tartare, I love it. But you're talking Kobe beef, some really good stuff. And I know where it came from and it's very fresh. But with a thermometer, what you're doing is you're making sure that the steak is done to your liking. And I want this to be medium rare, so I'm actually going to cook it to below the temperature I want. I'm going to cook it to 125. And that way when it sits, because I think the, one of the biggest mistakes a lot of people make is they cook it straight to the temperature they want, then they let it rest, and then, oh my gosh, it's overcooked. So what I'm going to do is just... I'm gonna flip it in just a second and I'm going to temp it and I'm only gonna to go to 125 because I want to have this be 130. So, looks like our first side is done and before I brown that second side, I should actually season it here. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw some seasoning on there. And there we go. Because we definitely don't want our meat to, to be unseasoned. So, I'm gonna temp the meat as soon as I flip the second one here, you can see the searing, and what the searing does is actually provide a lot of flavor. So I'm gonna cut my meat here. So it's doing really, really good. So far, it, it's actually doing very well. So on this one, it's a little bit thinner. I'm actually gonna take that one off as soon as that's seared because this particular one is almost up to temp as it is right now. So I don't want to overcook it. So I'm going to make sure that it is exactly where I want it. Oh, looks like it's not quite. Okay. I was getting a little worried there. So this one's starting to get up there. So I'm going to actually keep this going for another couple minutes and you'll notice it's not going to take that long. Um, when we're talking about doing steak, it, the thicker the steak, the longer it's going to take to cook. And these are very thin. These are probably maybe an inch, maybe a little less than that. I think the thinner one's probably closer to maybe uh, three quarters of an inch. So I don't want to cook these too long. and I'm monitoring the temperature very carefully. So I definitely don't want anything to be overcooked. So right now I've got it's almost there on the outside. 
in the center. It's coming up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this one is almost there right now. Do it a little longer. The other side here. So it's getting there, it's almost done. You'll notice I'm taking the temperature of the meat um, in several spots. Yeah, this one, I'm gonna actually take the thinner one off now just because I think it's, it's up where it needs to be. And I've got some aluminum foil here that I'm going to cover. So this one is almost there. Just another couple of minutes, but oh, it smells so good right now. It really does. And you notice I'm sitting here really watching the temperature of this like a hawk, because I definitely don't want this to overcook. And it looks like the edges are almost there. Yep, we've got some, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna take the other one off as well, but I'm gonna keep my heat on because I think, you know, bottled sauces are great, but actually doing a pan sauce is a little bit better. And one of the things I'm, other, I'm also gonna do is I'm going to throw this into the microwave uh, for five minutes, and this will give a perfect amount of time for this to rest. So I'm going to put that aside and I'm going to add my shallots and my thyme to my pan first. And I'm going to just wet these a little bit and start to scrape up any of the brown bits that occur in the pan. So I'm making sure that I'm getting all that flavor. And when you do that, Especially when you're when you're searing uh, steak that's in a pan, you get this great flavor, and it's called fond, and that is the flavor that ends up sticking to the pan. That's why when you're making pan sauces, you want your steak to stick a little bit so it leaves that uh, beautiful fond. So, just wanted to do that for a second, and now I'm going to add all of my liquids. So I'm going to add the red wine. I'm going to add the pomegranate juice. And I'm going to add the chicken stock. And I'm going to bring that up to a boil. And I'm also going to throw in a little bit of salt and pepper. A couple of good pinches of both, so it tastes good. So I'm going to get this up to a boil. And then what I'm gonna do is reduce this. So I'll keep scraping up any brown bits that are on the bottom. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get this reduced. So I'm gonna reduce this to um, a, maybe a tablespoon or two. So it's gonna take a couple of minutes to do that. So um, I'll check back with you as soon as my pan sauce is reduced. See you in a minute. Now our sauce is reduced and the last thing I have to do is to take some butter and add it to the pan. So I've actually turned the, um, I've turned the heat off because you don't want high heat when you're adding your butter. You want it to be turned off. So I'm adding that in and I'm just going to stir it, out, stir it around and it should only take a second to emulsify, melt down and emulsify this particular sauce. And it has reduced, it's nice and thick. And now our sauce is complete. And I'm going to show you what the whole thing looks like put together. I'll see you in just a second. Here we are, we have the finished dish. We have our dessert as well as our steak 
and a little bit of summer squash. Um, again, this is a special occasion meal. So we have some beef tenderloin, we have some summer squash, and we have a chocolatey dessert made with avocado and maple syrup. I hope you enjoyed this recipe. Please subscribe and check us out. Um, I'll have the full information about this particular recipe, actually both of these recipes, on our blog at yourlevelbest.net. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.